Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 12th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we outline two hugely important issues related to Prop 1 that both the Alaska media and many Alaskans are overlooking. Second, we discuss the false question about the PFD being put to legislative candidates in many of this fall's debates. Third, we discuss the impact reduced oil demand is having on ANS. And then as Michael and I sometimes do in wrap up, we have a bonus round to discuss what I'm looking for in this election cycle in preparation for the next session. And now let's join Michael. Let's talk about one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest conflicts that's going on in this election season, and that is proposition number one. Let's uh, talk about that. Well, there's been some recent uh, news articles, both in the ADN and uh, in this past week in the Alaska Public Media, that are that are trying to be summary articles, sort of laying out the groundwork of. You know, this is what Prop 1, the, the yes on one people say, this is what the no on one people say, and, uh, and, and this is, these are the facts you need to know when you, when you go to the polls. And both the ADN article and the Alaska Public Media article, I think, are lacking uh, two key facts. Uh, really don't explore them at all, and I think are leaving voters who are reading these articles uh, the worse. Uh, for for not truly understanding the the issues that are that, that are embedded in Prop One, and here are the two things that I think those articles are uh, are, are missing. One is who pays if Prop One doesn't pass. We know that we've got that we're facing a 2.3. Uh, Ledge Finance tells us now it's 2.4 billion dollar deficit in this coming year, over 50 percent. Uh, of the budget. We know we're facing that. We know that Prop 1 is would contribute uh, toward uh, uh, offsetting some of that uh, if it passed, offsetting some of that even next year, even the next fiscal year, but in, in, in subsequent years. We know that if Prop 1 doesn't pass, the budget hole is still going to be there. The budget hole that Prop 1 otherwise would fill is still going to be there. Um, and the question is, Who's going to pay? Who's going to fill that budget hole uh, if Prop One if Prop One doesn't pass? I think that's a key fact that that voters need to understand. It's not just oil. It's not just an oil policy issue. It's a fiscal policy issue. And and the question is, if if Prop One doesn't pass, if the, if that part of the budget hole isn't 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 filled with Prop One, who's going to pay uh, the difference? Some people sometimes say, well, we'll just cut. We'll just cut more. Well, right. you, you got to cut the entire way in order to, in order to avoid – you got to cut that entire $2.4 billion, which is not going to happen, in order to make Prop 1 irrelevant from that perspective. So it's, I, think, I think it's a hugely key issue about who pays if, if Prop 1 doesn't pass. And, and that's not being addressed in these articles at all. It wasn't in the ADN article. It wasn't in the public media article. And so, and so voters are being left with the impression that this is just an oil issue um, and we, can, we, we need to focus on it as an oil issue as opposed to a fiscal policy issue uh, and the question of, of who pays if, uh, if Prop 1 doesn't pass. 
The second piece that is is missing in these articles is briefly mentioned in the Alaska media article, media article, but it's not developed at all. The second issue is that Prop 1 can be amended by the legislature next year. Now, a lot of people focus on the fact that, well, it can't be repealed for two years, and so we're locking in. We aren't. The Alaska, the Alaska Constitution makes very clear, crystal clear, that, that uh, uh, propositions like Prop 1 can be amended at any time once they pass. The, 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 those who've, the constitutional founders didn't want to lock in the legislature lock in the state to a proposition that that would have flaws, um, and so they allow, they they provided that the legislature crystal clear that the legislature could amend it at any time. So, when you're thinking about Prop One, it's not it's not as some people in oil want to make it. Oh, this is just horrible. Uh, Aaron Shutt, uh, who's the president of Doyon, last week uh, in a debate. Uh, that was that was sponsored by Common Ground. Aaron Shutt said, "Well, we're not against oil paying more. We're just against Prop One. We're just against the the the, the them paying more under Prop One." Well, right. Aaron, you can amend Prop One when you get to the legislature. You're not locking in on Prop One. What you're really doing with Prop One is saying oil needs to be at the table. If you pass Prop One then oil's going to have to be addressed by the by the next legislature. If you don't pass Prop One, what's going to happen next legislature is oil's going to fold their arms and say, "Not us. We're not. We don't need to be here." The 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 voters said uh, uh, that we shouldn't be raising oil taxes. So you know, go go hit somebody else. Make somebody else pay. The way to get oil to the table is to pass Prop One and then let the legislature deal with it uh, uh, next session. And have all the hearings you want, and have all the analyses you want, and let oil fine tune it. I mean, we've been saying on this program for the last couple of years since the passage of the 2017 uh, uh, Trump tax cuts, we've been saying that there's there's a basis for looking for a bigger contribution from oil than what we're getting under 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 current law, and we can have those discussions next next session and modify Prop 1 into what is an appropriate set of legislation. The, the, the newspaper articles that are trying, and, and indeed it's the media too, K2 did a deal on this, the, 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 the media articles are essentially saying it's either or. You've either got to, you either pass Prop 1 with all of its bells and whistles, or you've, you've got to, if you don't like the bells and whistles, you've got to defeat Prop 1. There is a third very strong alternative here, which is to pass Prop 1 and then amend it uh, in the legislature to fit uh, the appropriate uh, uh, step up on, on oil. And I think, I think that is lacking from these media analyses also, and that is shortchanging voters in truly understanding what's, uh, what's going on with Prop 1. And so for those of you that don't are familiar, somebody asked, what is Prop 1 in the chat room? That is the new oil tax initiative that would increase the taxation on certain oil fields, legacy fields out there that's in front of the voters uh, coming up uh, in the general here. Uh, That is Prop 1. And again, many people on the more conservative Republican side have said that it will decimate uh, future oil and exploration, uh, and others have said it is the holy grail of of solving our problems, uh, to which Brad and I both agree it is neither of those things, I don't think. Uh, again, I'm still undecided on it because I have some real issues with it, specifically giving the legislature more money at this point when they have proven themselves to be such poor fiscal managers uh, on top of it and the opening up of all the uh, the oil companies' uh, uh, personal financial records. I have a real problem with that as well. But uh, let's just say that it's not what either side says that it is at this point. Right, Brad? Exactly, and and I think I think that's what's lacking in these media articles that it's not the two extremes. I mean, Brenna Brenna for his own reasons is painting it as the holy grail, as the billion dollar savior to Alaska's fiscal situation. He he wants to he wants obviously all of the provisions of Prop One enacted enacted. So he's not talking about the middle ground. Oil wants to paint the you know the Armageddon picture, which is you know a billion dollars of of additional costs piling in on the oil industry and the impacts that have, uh, and and they want to paint it that way because that base to say, oh no, we can't handle that, and and so neither one are motivated to 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 talk about 
the issue of, of finding a middle ground and the issue of who pays uh, uh, in, the, in the alternative if, uh, if, if oil doesn't pay that segment. And so what media is doing is focusing on those two extremes, and they're not exploring if there's, an, if there's another landing spot out of all of this, which is, which is you know, addressing it, uh, setting up the fact that oil has to come to the table in the next legislature and, and be part of the overall fiscal discussion as opposed to being able to dodge it. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're talking about the weekly top three. People will have to make up their own minds on this. I know that folks in the chat room are split uh, on this, uh, voting yes and voting no on Prop 1 uh, for, for a multiplicity of reasons, a couple that I just outlaid there. and uh, But we're going to have to make up our decisions here pretty quick. One way or the other, we've got to fill the $2.5 billion budget gap, and if it's not this – then we have to find some other way to do it. I wonder about keeping the pressure up on the politicians, Brad, um, to uh, you know by starving the beast, so to speak. Uh, but your fear is that if we do that, if we say no to one, then that leaves only the dividend, the remainder of the dividend on the table. Is that your is that your position on this? Well, it leaves it leaves the dividend or other revenues that are going to have to come out of Alaska families' uh, pockets. If, if, if oil doesn't if oil isn't part of the contribution and I as I said what I think what I, what I what I am concerned happens if prop one doesn't pass is oil goes into the next session folds their arms and say we don't have to come to the table um, our the voters said that, that you shouldn't raise taxes on us so go go find somebody else uh, to hit and and you know all of the concerns that they raised during the during the fall election season. And I've been around legislatures enough, and I've been around oil enough to know that that's a fairly successful strategy to sort of wait out the five months or the six months of the uh, of the legislature. Uh, just fold your arms, stay away from the table, and say, I don't have to be, be here. What Prop 1 does is force them to the table, because there's a backstop. If, the, if we don't find amendments, if we don't find the common ground uh, on, on how oil contributes to this situation, then Prop One goes Prop One goes into effect, full force and effect, and oil is going to have to pay under Prop One. So prop, passing Prop One brings oil to the table, and I think brings uh, helps fashion an overall solution uh, that's not going to be there if uh, if we don't have oil at the table. Larry says expecting any legislature to amend a bill at a future date to fix bad law is stupid. Does anyone remember SB twenty one and just how long we have been impacted by it before they changed it? Um, and uh, I mean, I don't know if you want to comment on that, Brad, but I think that's a lot of people's fears is that, yes, they have the power to amend it, but will they is the question. Well, it's, it's, we're going to have to address fiscal issues this coming legislature. I think oil has to be part of the package. Um, and yes, I think, you know, given the legislature, I think we're headed to, uh, I think it is uh, realistic to think that it would be amended as part of, as part of the overall package. Um, the alternative is not to enact Prop 1 and for oil not to be part of the solution, and so the, that share of the burden being pushed off on somebody else. Um, and I think, I think the much better course is to enact Prop 1, expect the legislature to, to amend it as it's, as it's solving the entire fiscal situation, as it's going to have to, uh, and then uh, come out with a, uh, with a total package as opposed, to, uh, as opposed to a package that leaves out oil. Uh, Jana Davis uh, agrees with Brad, said yes, it would force the conversation and lead to a potential compromise, forcing the conversation with the oil companies, bringing them to the table. Um, aren't the oil companies, asked Stephanie, aren't the oil companies already paying a fair share in tax to Alaska? Why is it their responsibility to fill the debt hole even while our lawmakers won't cut appropriately? Um, to which I'll I'll start off that uh, answer by saying, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution says that all uh, resources in the state of Alaska are to be managed and developed to the maximum benefit of the citizens of the state. And that means if there is any money left on the table, if there is any you know thing that we are not getting our share of as owners of the resource, then we have a, a, a constitutional duty to make it so. And even people such as Brad, who is an oil and gas guy and has been for years, agrees that there is still money left on the table, then yeah, we should be taking a larger share of that if it is possible. Uh, Brad, I'll let you respond from your position there. Well, I, 
the, 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 the constant theme since Governor Hammond about oil has been the share, there's a share, uh, the, 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 the wealth is shared between the federal government who takes it out through federal income taxes, corporate income taxes, the producers, uh, and the state. In 2017, after the enactment of SB 21, in 2017, the federal government significantly reduced its share by reducing corporate income taxes. All of that share then went to the producers. All of the share that the federal government reduced uh, by reducing corporate income taxes then went to the producers. None of that came back uh, to the to the state. And I think you know, even if you go back and say SB 21 was perfect, the the the, the division between the federal government. The state and the producers changed in 2017, and we've never caught up with that. The state's never come in and said, okay, federal government decided it was going to step down some of its share. Some of that should now go to the state. We've, we've never caught up with that because every legislature uh, has – oil has essentially said no change, no change, no change, uh, and, and they've gotten away with it, every legislature. So what Prop 1 does is say, okay, oil, you've got to come to the table. And, and I think the right way is to address that portion of the share that the federal government packed, backed away from and to take uh, a, a, a share of the state for that. I, that's, not, that's not increasing the burden on, on the producers from the original deal. It's simply the state stepping up and saying, hey, I'm entitled to a portion of what the federal, of what the federal government backed away from. Um, and I and I think we ought to determine what that is. So those who argue it's an increased burden and you know the oil company can't stand it, it's it's a five. What Prop One does at current oil prices is increase costs by five percent. That's the equivalent of the increase in transportation costs that the producers are 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 accepting uh, over a four year period from 2018, 2019 to to, to 2022. So it's it's not it's not the end of the world. I mean, they're not complaining about the increased transportation costs. They're they just don't want to accept any any. They just don't want to give back any more of the share they got right. from the federal government. And I right. think it's time that we get that share back. Uh, let's move on to number two. Of course, the PFD, as I just mentioned, is one of the options that's on the table for filling that gap. Uh, you say that there's a lot of false questionings, though. Kind of this this whole false question around it. Well, a recent debate question phrased it as, please be specific about what level of PFD you think is appropriate and what state services you would cut to pay for it. They're always, again, ascribing this to it's a government expense, and so you'd have to cut something for the PFD to be paid. Uh, what say you? Well, I think that is a false question. It's, it's People are trying to set up those who argue for the PFD, for a full PFD, or a statutory PFD, or some sort of set PFD, they're trying to always say pivot to say, well, okay, what what in state spending are you going to cut then? Because because of course the PFD would otherwise go to go to state spending, and I think that's a false question. There are other ways to raise revenues more, much more equitably uh, than than through PFD cuts, which have the largest adverse impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. The largest adverse impact on the on the Alaska economy, according to 2016 uh, ICER study, there are much more equitable ways to way, to raise revenues. So I don't think I don't think the question is if you're for the PFD, what in state spending are you going to cut? I think the question is if you're for the PFD, how are you otherwise going to deal with the with the budget gap? And to that, I think uh, uh, you know Governor Dunleavy's uh, uh, proposed. Uh, balanced approach, which is, you know, uh, significant cuts plus some PFD restructuring plus some additional revenues, uh, equitable revenues. I think that's the answer to that question. But, but people try to set it up as this dichotomy. People who want the PFD to be cut try to set it up as this dichotomy of if you're going to save the PFD, then you're going to have to have spending cuts, deep spending cuts, and what is it you're going to, what is it you're going to cut? Because then we're going to, you know, it, it, we're going to we're going to enrage whatever faction supports the the element of cost that you want cut and and come after you. So it's, it's just a setup question, and I think it's a false question, and I think it's not it's not helping the debate about what our fiscal plan ought to be next year. For candidates to allow and for, for, for forums to be asking the question that way and for candidates to feel like they have to respond, oh, my gosh, if I'm for the PFD, then I've got to be for, uh, for cutting some, some big program someplace.
Continuing now with Brad Keith Lee, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Talking with him about the weekly top three. We're in the middle of number two, which is this uh, no-win scenario, this question that keeps getting asked about, well, if you want a full PFD, what do you cut? Uh, a reminder, the PFD was never intended for to pay for government in the way that it is right now. There is a plan out there, the Hammond 50-50 plan, that would refigure the dividend and uh, and give them a more sustainable revenue stream. Uh, but that's, uh, that's, of course, the legislature could change the statute to match that. They, of course, just continue to ignore the statute instead and not want to talk about it. Brad, there is a, a better way to do this. There is a better way to do this, Michael. I mean, it, the, the Governor Dunleavy's uh, the Scenario 5 that was in last year's uh, OMB uh, 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 plan, 10-year plan, outlines a better way. And the better way is for a significant share of cuts. It's, it's basically a, three, a three-pronged plan. A significant share of cuts, um, uh, uh, restructuring of the PFD to POMV 5050, which is, I think, much more consistent with the with the original Hammond vision than uh, than the than the current statutory approach, uh, and then uh, some some additional new revenues uh, that that fill whatever remaining gap there is that isn't eliminated by by cuts, and there will be some. I mean, we're we're, like, we're staring at a two point four billion dollar deficit, fifty percent for fifty percent of the budget, and it's not just me that's saying that. Clem Tillian in a in an article, Clem Tillian who who we all know was was there with Governor Hammond at the at the creation of the PFD, who's been one of his staunchest advocates uh, of the PFD uh, in an October 1 editorial uh, in the ADN, said this, after making targeted cons- consolidation and cuts and after protecting the rights of Alaskans to receive a PFD, then and only then should we consider just how to pay any additional costs necessary to support a right-sized government. If that includes taxes, so be it. I lit, This is Clem. I lived in Alaska when we paid our way for services we needed. I did it before, and I'll gladly do it again. So even the staunchest PFD advocate out there, one of the members of the you know the Protect the PFD, um, someone who who people look up to as being uh, the, one of the fathers of the PFD, one of the staunchest advocates of the PFD, recognizes that that. One that that a necessary step in preserving the PFD is going to be uh, to pay some uh, pay some additional revenues that are much more equitably recovered than uh, than than revenues coming out of the PFD. Now the one the one issue here with with Clem's statement and the one issue when other people say, well, I'll consider taxes after we've had spending cuts. We used to have time. To go sequentially like that, we used to have time to say, "Okay, we're going to make deep cuts this session. We're going to ride through on some adi- some savings, uh, and then next session we're going to have the revenue session." We used to we used to have time to do that. We really don't now. I mean, we're out of savings. We've 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 had this discussion on the show that we've drained the SBR, the statutory budget reserve, and we've drained the constitutional budget reserve. We've run through twenty billion dollars of savings in the past eight years. And now we've got. Now we're in a session where we've got to face up to all of this at once. Some of it is uh, one step of it is preserving, memorializing, constitutionalizing if we can the PFD. Another piece of it is uh, is is making uh, deep spending cuts uh, to the extent we can. But a third of it, and and you can't avoid this. A third of it is going to be looking at new revenues. That's why I think you know back to Prop 1 for a, a second, that's why I think Prop 1 is so important, because I think oil plays a role uh, in those new revenues. But there are going to be needs for other new revenues. We're going to have to do that all uh, in the coming session. I just think it's unfair to, to look at candidates and say, okay, what, if you want the PFD, what are you going to cut? It's, it's, not, it's not that 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 binary decision. If you want the PFD, how are you otherwise going to handle the budget? That's that should be the question, and that should be what candidates are prepared to answer. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, is our guest. We're talking about the weekly top three. Uh, the PFD, obviously, uh, one of the biggest issues out there for folks, and uh, and I think you know, uh, rightly so. Uh, we it is our fair share of the 
oil resource that we own collectively here in the state, and unfortunately, uh, the courts have turned it more into a government subsidy than anything else, which I think is the biggest part of the problem. But we need to move on here to the final uh, of the weekly top three, which is ANS oil production, Alaska North Slope oil production. And uh, what is uh, going on with that, considering that there's a continuing depression in oil demand? What does it mean for us in the future here, Brad? There's a, there, there was a, a statement last week or the week before last by the Commissioner of Revenue when she was presenting before House Finance that the day before Alieska, the pipeline service company that runs TAPS, had announced a curtailment on the TAP system uh, because storage was filling up in, in Valdez and they were they needed to reduce flow in order not to not to threaten overflowing storage. Um, and and we've seen that that lasted about five or six days and now we're sort of out of that. But we're we're gonna see continuations of that going forward. I track on, on the oil side, I track fairly closely what's going on in the US West Coast refinery market. And it's not; it's bounced back to about 80% of where it was pre-COVID, and it's just stuck there. I mean, that that seems to be where we're going to be for an extended period uh, with uh, with the West Coast refineries. Um, and at the same time, uh, we've diverted; we've been diverting tankers over to China, ANS tankers over to China. We've got two; we got three over there right now. Uh, three out of ten uh, ANS tankers are over in. Uh, uh, delivering product or, or taking product over to taking oil over to over to China, um, and and so we've used that as a as sort of a uh, uh, a relief valve market, but China is is it has filled up its inventories and it's reducing demand also, so I think I think we need to be prepared for a period, and that and that period is going to run as long as running and as long as COVID is uh, depressing demand on the West Coast. Uh, I think we're going to see a period where we've, we've effectively got a cap on the demand for uh, ANS crude, and we're going to see these periods of curtailment come along. Uh, and uh, the consequence of that is I think we're going to see lower production uh, this coming year, not because of lack of incentives, not because of lack of drilling, not because you know somehow we passed Prop 1, but because the market that absorbs ANS uh, is, uh, is constrained. Uh, as a result of COVID, uh, and and China is constrained because they've sort of filled up all their inventory, and they're uh, and they're uh, they don't need they don't have as much demand as they as they had before. So it's something that I think we need to we need to incorporate into our thinking that uh, that maybe all of the production that we anticipated being able to push out of of uh, out of the North Slope isn't going to be absorbed in the market. We're going to have these periods where we where we have to cut back. Well, and it's simply because again the demand is not there, so they will slow down production, so they don't have to warehouse it. Right? I mean, it's cheaper to warehouse it in the ground than it is to put it in tankers and float them offshore. Yeah, exactly right. And and for a and and for a and s, uh, the constraint is the is the storage capacity we have at Valdez. I mean, when you send a tanker off to China, it doesn't come back for 30 days. It's not it's not around to to, right. to take any more crude. So it's we're really constrained by the by the storage capacity we have at Valdez, and and we've been running that fairly high. And if we don't have market on the West Coast for another tanker, uh, as we used to have, um, it, then it's going to stay at Valdez. There's one other contributing factor. The fact that we're that we no longer have vertically integrated companies uh, on the North Slope is is contributing. BP no longer can just stick it into its own refinery. BP has no BP doesn't have any share of the production, so it's not looking to stick it in its refinery. That's right. contributing also. Right. All right. Finishing up uh, with Brad Keithley, as we often do, we like to uh, bring him back on for one more bite at the apple here before we uh, run the clock out into hour two. We got about three or four minutes here. Uh, Brad, anything we didn't hit on today that you wanted to uh, touch base on? I mean, other than the whole Maury Povich show going on in Anchorage. What, <laughs> what, 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 <laughs> oh man! Now, Michael, I, I guess from my hole in the ground, what what people really need to get their brains around is that next session, next legislative session, is going to be the the fiscal policy come to Jesus session. Um, and they need to be thinking through the implications of that. I, as I say, I think it backs up into Prop 1. Uh, I think it backs up into how you think about the PFD uh, and, 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 and the issue of, of spending cuts and, and, and everything else. 
but you need I think people need to really wrap their brains around that that everything's going to hit the fan. We're finally going to have to come to ground on fiscal policy right. uh, in, in the next session. Did you uh, happen to hear my interview yesterday with Lance Pruitt? I did not. Okay, so interesting question to Lance. I was talking about the PFD and the fact that it had the largest adverse impact, and especially on the lowest income Alaskans, that they were paying the lion's share of it, and that if we needed to talk about alternative revenues, that maybe we needed to talk about a sales tax or a flat tax or some other kind of tax to be able to spread that burden more equitably. His immediate reaction was, well, if we do that, we'll immediately lose. People will move out of state. You know, Bob Gillum has told me that if, if there's another tax in Alaska, he'll move and all these other people are moving. I said, so wait a second. You're uh, all about carrying the burden on the lowest income Alaskans, but you know, not spreading that burden to all the people uh, you know, equitably across the board. Well, there's not enough money to do that, and we can't just take all of the PFD because people won't stand for that, essentially. Uh, but if we if we put any kind of tax in, we will immediately start losing all of our higher, you know, all of the the the, the higher dollar earners in the state of Alaska. And I'm just like, this is Brad's. It, this is what you've been saying come to life in, in folks uh, who are going back to the legislature. Yeah, it's it's the question is how you design a revenue system that lessens the burden on everybody. And and the way you do that is you spread it as broadly as you can. We've got twenty five billion dollars in in income in this state, twenty seven when you count uh, uh non resident income uh earned in the state. A flat tax that spread across that entire income stream would be relatively low on everybody. And and it would be it, it, uh, people are not gonna leave uh, if they have to pay just a, a, a portion, uh, a small portion of their income that would result from a flat tax. What, what, what Lance, I think, is concerned about is a progressive income tax that would lump, that would take the burden that's currently lumped on middle and lower income Alaska families and lump it on top 20%. We shouldn't do that either. Nobody should be paying a disproportionate share of this burden. Right. We ought to find ways to spread it as broadly as we can. And if we do that, no... Alaska family, not the not middle income Alaska families, not lower income Alaska families, and not upper income Alaska families are going to have to share an undue burden that's going to force them to to engage in other conduct. It's just it just it, it, it irritates me when the top twenty percent say, "Oh, we're we're going to leave," um, and so we got to shove it off on middle and lower income Alaska families. I, that's just that's just a lack of understanding of how you can design revenue measures to spread them broadly and to limit the impact on everybody. Uh, let me see here if there's any other comments. Um, uh, it was an interesting conversation. I'd, I'd love to get your take on that whole interview yesterday because I was a little flummoxed by the end of it. Uh, I'll go back and listen to it. Pick a number for a flat tax and put it in the Constitution, says Willie. Ten times we've been through this. Create stability and the legislator's ability to increase taxes every time they spend themselves into a hole. I think first and foremost what we need to do is get a constitutional spending cap in there, first of all, to put rails on this whole discussion. And then we could talk about revenues if that's the case. I mean, but but we need to get that spending control in there first and foremost. Yeah, but keep in mind... We've we've collapsed the time frame. We're gonna have to do all this at once. Yep. Uh, there's there's not there's no backup savings that 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 we can sort of glide through this over a two or three year period. We we told ourselves we were doing that back in the twenty teens. We never did it, and now we've now we've used up all those savings. So yes, maybe early in the session do the spending cap, and then late in the session do revenues. But it's going to have to all come in one session. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, we're coming up uh, on the election day. Uh, any final thoughts or people that you're supporting, things that you're pushing out there that folks need to know about? i got about a minute here. Yeah, I would, I'm would. i looking for candidates who talk about balance, who talk about spending realistic, deep, but realistic level of spending cuts, who talk about some PFD restructuring, and who talk who admit the need, just like Clem does, admit the need for some additional revenues and talk about, you know, fair and equitable ways of raising those revenues. I, candidates who understand balance, I think, are going to serve us well in the next legislature. Candidates who say, oh, it's all got to be one way. It's all got to be spending cuts or it's all got to come out of the PFD or it's all got to be raised through those revenues. 
those candidates I don't think are going to are going to further the ball. They're going to be bottlenecks. So I'm looking for candidates to talk about balance. Right. And what I'm finding more and more is that many candidates uh, choose in one camp or the other, uh, you know, all cuts, all PFD, all something else. And yet they don't have a whole lot of specifics about it. And they're not even willing to discuss the possibility of new revenue. Again, I'm not a fan of taxes. I don't want taxes. But we have to at least talk about them as a possibility of one of the options in the quiver. Otherwise, we're ignoring one of the biggest things in the room. We are, and we're pushing the burden to somebody else. Yeah, absolutely. We're essentially saying, okay, we're going to take it out of PFD cuts as the default. And yeah. that pushes it to a middle and lower income Alaska family. We're already being taxed, and most people don't even know it. Uh, all right, uh, Brad, thank you so much for coming on board and joining us. We appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.